good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's so nice to see so many of you here. Thank you for coming out and not being in the Hamptons. That's lovely of you. Uh, <laughs> before I start, um, I would just like to mention, as always, that programs at the Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you very much to our Friends of the Library. It's the Friends of the Library who make programs like this possible, as well as our collections and a lot of our technology. So we are incredibly grateful to be able to put on fantastic programs like these, and we thank our friends very much. Um, Tonight, you are all here to see Dagmara Dominczyk, yes? Um, I'm almost Polish. Uh, Dag is one of those people who you would like to be mad at. I think most people would be perfectly content to be beautiful, successful actress who was married to a beautiful man <laughs> with two beautiful children and a beautiful life and a beautiful house, but not Dag. Oh no, she had to go write a beautiful book too. Um, and aren't we grateful for it? On her blog, just a couple days ago, she wrote, in my 20s, I wrote to chronicle my angst and my words were a shield, a cover. In my 30s, I write to tell a story and my words are a funnel and what propels me now is happiness. And I think the contradiction and the juxtaposition of the two, those of you who have read the book already know that's sort of at the heart of the book, moving from one to the other and maybe back occasionally. The Lullaby of Polish Girls is the story of three friends, Anna, Justina, and Camilla. And it goes back and forth between adolescence and adulthood and angst and happiness. And those don't align always the way you would think. You'd think the angst would go with the teenage years and the happiness with the adult years. But not so much all the time. Um, and as her Polish girls go back and forth and make the similar transitions, it just makes this beautiful blended book um, as you see these three girls go through it. Um, we are so proud to have Dag here and presenting her book for our latest First Look Darien. A lot of you have been to earlier First Look Darien uh, events, and you know that we started this program because we wanted to have a way to showcase in Darien debut authors who we thought showed a lot of promise and already had a tremendous talent. And we wanted to be really supportive at the early stage of their career when authors just need that little extra nudge to make it into the, you know, the national consciousness and the bestseller list and all that. Um, and I'm confident that after you meet Dag and hear her read, she's going to read and speak a little bit and take some questions. Um, after you meet Dag and read her book, you will understand why we picked her and why we think she's such an important new talent on the writing scene. Please join me in welcoming Dagmar Bimini. That was so lovely. I have to take you home. You can introduce me to my kids every night at the dinner table. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I can leave. Um, I'm so happy to be here, uh, especially that this is a library. So before I start talking about the book, I want to talk about uh, libraries for a second. Um, and this is going to sound very dramatic. But it's very true that growing up as a young immigrant kid in Brooklyn, uh, a little library saved me, actually, from a small life, from a life of obscurity, from um, kind of a measly life. There was a library across the street from the Glenwood Housing Projects where I grew up. And um, my parents are very blue collar. My dad was a um, kind of a solidarity freedom fighter. I'll get into that later. But his, his, his life here, when we emigrated, um, became very blue collar. He was a cab driver, he was a janitor, he was a superintendent. My mother cleaned homes for cash. Um, we didn't go to the theater, we didn't go to the movies, we didn't go to sporting events. There was no time and there was no money, and that's it. But I found this little library across the street. By the time I was 10, I could speak English quite well, read it quite well. And every day after school, I would drop my bag and I would run across the street to this library, the Pettigate Library. Very small. Maybe it was like this one room. This is an amazing library. And I would spend about two, three hours there reading and, and walking around and looking at the magazines and going from section to section to section, laying on my tummy on the floor. I was 10, 11 every day. And then I would get to the point where I had to pick out my books. And I would pick about as many as I could carry across the street, 15, 20. And I would always return them late, because I guess I didn't want to return them at all. But what books taught me, aside from the English language, um, was that uh, different worlds existed, and you could travel, and it didn't cost you anything, just a library card. And I began to dream, and some of the books I read, I, 
I, I tree grows in Brooklyn and all the kind family are, I commiserated with. And some of the books I read, like Babysitter's Club, <laughs> showed me in America that I wanted to aspire to living in a house on a tree-lined street, like I do now. But it opened up the world for me, and it made me believe in myself. Books did. And the reason I had books was because of this library. So it's so uh, full circle and so um, touching anytime I talk in the library. Um, and that's why I'm doubly proud to be here tonight and happy to be here tonight. <clears throat> OK. So I wrote this book, <laughs> The Lullaby of Polish Girls. I'm going to read a little just a few excerpts, and I'm going to skip around the book, and I'm going to skip around within what I'm reading uh, and talk a little. And It's a slim volume, but don't let the size fool you, because a lot happens. and It goes back and forth in time, three different points of view. It sounds very confusing, and you're going to have to work a little. There's Polish words in it, but I think it's, there's cusses in it. I'm just warning you. <laughs> I have a notorious potty mouth that I'm tempering. Okay, I won't drop any F-bombs tonight. <laughs> This is a story about three Polish girls who were all born in one town, Kielce, Poland, kind of like uh, Pittsburgh or something, uh, if I would equate it to an American city, maybe even a Harrisburg. Uh, blue collar, working class, famous for its mayo factory, and that's about it. And one of these girls uh, ends up in New York City in 1983, much like myself. The other two stay behind and try to make lives for themselves. And every summer they get together. Anna goes, one of the girls is Anna. She comes to Poland, uh, and they spend three months out of the year together. And it's amazing. It's wild. It's fun. It's youthful. It's what summers are about. And then Anna becomes an actress, much like myself. <laughs> you can guess which character is based on me. Uh, and their lives go separate ways, really, really distinctly separate ways. And something pretty terrible brings them back together. So it's part coming of age. Uh, it's part friendship story. And the backdrop is contemporary Poland, which not a lot of books are written about, contemporary blue-collar Poland, this town, this city. Um, so I'm going to introduce each character, and then I'll talk a little about more of the genesis of the book and all that. So the first girl is Anna who, much like Dad, emigrates to the New York City at seven years old. Her father is a political dissident, much like my father was. Um, and when she's 12 years old, her father, who's still working on behalf of Solidarity, which was this freedom fighting union, uh, goes to Germany. He's smuggling in printing presses to the Eastern Bloc countries, which is what my dad did. There's a lot of similarities between Anna and me. And uh, her uncle is driving to Poland for three days to smuggle this thing in for her dad. And Anna begs, all of a sudden, to go back to Poland, even for three days. And her father's kind of dumbstruck, because Anna's a very studious, shy, keeps her feelings to herself, although she has big feelings. And she begs if she can go back to Poland for those three days with her uncle. And her father acquiesces. And after six years, Anna finds herself standing in front of her grandmother's apartment building. And it's um, uh, like she's time traveling. For example, she gets out of the car. I'll just read a little tiny thing. By the thicket of rowan berry trees, which are full of the bright red yajambine that she suddenly remembers picking as a little girl, Anna stares at the rug beater. The trzepak, rug beater, is made up of three. I have poles in the audience. <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. The trzepak is made up of three iron poles that fit together like a frame, planted into the ground with a fourth pole slicing the middle. Vacuum cleaners were still a Western luxury, and in the 50s, local communist housing administrations erected these trzepaki in every neighborhood. When she was little, Anna remembers people dragging their rugs and carpets outside, hanging them over the poles and thumping them with what looked like tennis rackets. Anna closes her eyes and can hear the thump, thump sound that used to echo like a chorus and wake her up in the mornings. The sudden memory is so vivid that she remains frozen. 
And then she makes her way up the stair while her uncle stays behind. She opens the door and there's her whole family and it's a big reunion, they can't recognize her. She's worried, she looks too American. She's buxom, she's tall, she's blonde, she looks American. And after she eats her grandma's meal, she decides she wants to go outside. This is her first summer back. This is kind of what sets up all these summers. When she opens the apartment building stairwell door, she sees that a dozen or more kids have gathered around. Most are hanging off the rug beater. Some of them are squatting in front of it. They are an army of small warriors holding down the fort in the face of an intruder. They must have seen the German car pull up. Maybe someone caught a glimpse of a tall girl in Levi's and spread the word. Anna walks tentatively toward them. The boys, assorted ages but not sizes, with legs so skinny that it makes her sad, those giant knees, pretend to be idle with other things like gum chewing. The girls stare at her unabashedly. They are all, boys and girls alike, clad in polyester short shorts and open-toed sandals. Suddenly, one kid, whose shorts are so small they look like underwear, squints up and asks, movie football school? Anna nods, and the boy continues. That's a Volkswagen, right? What are you, from Germany? It's in Polka. Anna wants to say, I'm Polish. But it's too early to feel defensive, so she merely shakes her head no. Then a pretty girl who looks to be around Anna's age and has brown hair that's cropped like a boy's asks, then where are you from? Because obviously you're not from here. The girl stands with her arms folded sternly across her chest, waiting for Anna to answer. Some of the other girls chuckle and Anna flushes pink. Christine, I know I'm touching my hair a lot. Okay. <laughs> I touch my hair a lot and my friend's always like, don't touch your hair. Okay. <laughs> the folded arms girl wears orange cotton shorts with flowers on them, an outfit that would be ridiculed in the States. Actually, I am from here. I was born here, but I live in New York City. A slight hush befalls the group. You mean like America? Asks another boy, whose unfortunate bangs cut right across the middle of his forehead in a perfectly straight line. Anna nods again. Ya pierdole! exclaims a kid who can't be more than six. I'll be fucked. Sorry, guys. And then everybody cracks up, including Anna. The next day, Anna runs outside as soon as she wakes up. She exchanges addresses with her new friends. The pretty brunette is Justina Zator, whose mother was best friends with Anna's mother, Paulina. Justina tells Anna that their moms got pregnant the same year and both of them had to quit school and that their mothers still keep in touch. I know everything about you, girl. I know you live in Brooklyn and that your dad drives an Audi. Justina pronounces it Brooklyn, and Anna smiles. On the third day, skipping around, the day of her departure, tears are shed. Anna weeps, her cousins weep, her aunts weep while chain smoking on the balcon, and Babcha weeps in the kitchen, kneading her rosary. Anna tries to cheer them up and vows to return in 10 months. She'll work after school and buy her own airplane ticket if she has to. An hour before Uncle Adam comes to pick her up, Anna says goodbye to the apartment. She stands in every corner, touching each wall with her palms, touching as many things as possible. I'll come back, she whispers to the tiny pink bathtub in the bathroom. Vruza. As the car zooms past St. Yusuf's church, her childhood neighborhood of Shaduvak disappears just like that. And in the back seat, Anna feels her heart breaking. Just a few kilometers away, but she already feels tasknota, a Polish word that describes a kind of yearning for which there is no American equivalent. So that's when Araba Anna Baron returns to Poland. And guess what? Something similar happened to me. <laughs> I returned when I was 12. It took three days for me to fall in love with my homeland, one that I hadn't seen in seven years. Three days for me to promise to come back every summer, which I did till I was 22, with the help of my parents who worked their butts off all year long to send us back. And uh, it was interesting growing up in New York City, growing up in the projects, and I went to performing arts high school for drama. I decided to take my love of stories and translate them to telling them on stage. And performing arts high school was amazing. It was kids from all over the city who had big dreams, who wanted to be big, 
names, big artists who had all these feelings who they translated into paintings or songs or dances. It was an amazing environment and it was full of possibility. And at 14 and 15 and 16, we were so excited about the future. These young artists from all walks of life, from the city, this great city. And then every summer I would say goodbye, to, every summer I would say goodbye to them and I would get on a plane and go to Poland. And with my American girlfriends, all we talked about was the future, right? Like I said. Because the future was enticing, it was possible, it was full of anything we wanted. And the kids that I was friends with in Szydówek, in this kind of poor neighborhood, uh, lived a completely different um, existence. They didn't live for tomorrow. They lived for right now. They lived for the summers. They lived for basic things like having fun and going out. Uh, and they loved me because I was one of them, but I was different. And I've represented to them, I think, um, you know, in 1990, 91, 92, Poland was still, you know, the, the curtain was just rising, that iron curtain. So America was still something that you, you saw in movies. And here I was, a live thing from that place, and I represented possibilities and dreams. And, and, uh, and for them, for me, they represented something I didn't have in America, which was my past roots, these faded memories I had of my grandmother living there. Um, Poles are very tough, but we're super sentimental. And it hit the spot every time I was in Poland. Um, and yes, there were moments where I was confused. I don't belong there, I don't belong here. But mostly, it was really nice and lovely to feel special in both places to not worry about my buck teeth or the fact that my parents didn't have money because I was this exotic Polish girl. And in Poland, I had more money than anybody there. And I would come every summer with bags of t-shirts that said, I love New York, and candy, and give it out like a, I don't know, Mother Teresa. <laughs> and I was loved in both places. And for a while, it was awesome. And then something changed. Um, I graduated college, and I began my dream of trying to fulfill my career as an actress, and I was, uh, and I was good, quite early on and successful, meaning I got a movie, and then I got another movie. And um, my friends stayed in Kielce and had babies and lived with their parents and worked the till at the supermarket. And I loved them so much, and I was having a really hard time identifying with them. So, Anyway, so that's Anna, that's me. I won't make this long for every character. Uh, the second girl is Camila. Now Camila is the um, second part of this little triangle I've made up here. She's a Polish girl and, uh, well, I'll read one section and you'll understand who Camila is in a second. So this is 1989 when Anna just comes back for that one weekend and she's ripped back away and back to New York and, and there's a kid in the neighborhood that missed it that missed that American girl coming here. And her name is Camila. And she's so upset, she comes running to her mother, crying about why was she away at the Jauka. Now a Jauka is what Polish people in small cities, it was kind of like their getaway house, except um, you bought a plot of land as big as that desk, about 10 miles out of the city, and uh, you put a house and you planted strawberries and that was your country home. And uh, everyone had them, my grandmother had them, it was like, and you could see the skyscrapers of those disgusting communist housing projects in the distance, but you are in the country. And that's where Camila was during this weekend. So she decides to write this girl, Anya, Anna, a letter because her mother knows Anna's mother and they still, well, you'll see. And this is the letter she writes. Droga Anya. Dear Anya. I'm very sorry that I have to introduce myself in a letter. I wish I could have done it in person, but you see, my father and I were on our Jauka the weekend you visited, and so I missed you. Don't think I haven't been kicking myself ever since. Everyone said that you were really nice and friendly and also very pretty. If you're wondering how I got your address, don't worry, it wasn't from Justyna. She wouldn't share it with me, and I think you should know this because real friends share everything. This letter will be short because maybe you won't want to write to me. You might be too busy with life in America, or you may have too many pen pals already. But I thought I would give it a shot because I'm very friendly too. I can't get over the fact that I didn't meet you. 
Did you know that our moms went to school together and that we were born just six weeks apart? I thought that was really neat. I'm older. Oh, I almost forgot. My name is Kamila Marhevska. I live in Klatka 63, which is just a few doors up from your grandma's. Just like you, I'm an only child. Well, I did have a brother who drowned when he was three, but I was five, and I don't really remember him. My mom's name is Zofia. That's how I got your address from my mom, because your mom still sends us holiday cards. And we were baptized on the same day at St. Yusuf, so you see, we're already connected. I'm in the eighth grade coming this fall. I can't believe the summer's almost over. It makes me want to shout with despair. No more gorgeous sunsets or bonfires, and the Tentra pool will be closing. My grandmother died in January, and I've finally gotten over it, because everything is better in the summer. But that, too, is over now, and I'm dreading the school year. Anyway, if rumors are true, and you really are coming next year for the whole vacation, then that is so wonderful, and I will wait for you and cross off the days of my calendar till your arrival. I think we're going to be better friends than you and Justina because she can be really mean, and she's also a liar. But you don't have to tell her I said that. Prosha, you right back. Kamila Mariana Marevska. And she sends the letter and wonders how many days it takes for a letter to sail across the Atlantic. And of course, Anna writes back. And of course, the next summer, Anna comes. And there is Camila by the rug beater, waiting for her new best friend. And then Justina is the third friend. So the novel is like this. It starts off in 2002 with a, uh, a phone call that brings really horrific, awful news from Poland to Anna. And every other chapter is these summers. And they're all dissected into three parts from each girl's point of view. Sounds like a lot, but once you get past chapter one, you'll be in it, I promise you. So this is what we find out in the very beginning of the novel, page 15, even sooner. So the third girl, Justina, you know the girl with the short brown hair, that was like, where are you from? She's the feisty one. She's the sexy one. She's like the boy magnet one, because every triangle of girls needs a Justina. Um, and while Anna is off having an acting career at 25, and Camila is running away from a, from a husband, this is what happens to Justina. The last 24 hours have brought a bloodbath upon the Stravich home. They have brought the inevitable, but Justina can't see that now. All she can see is that overnight she has become someone who will be whispered about. From now on, people will whisper that she's too sad or not sad enough. They'll whisper accusations and apologies. And surely they'll whisper if she ever finds another man, but who the fuck in this town will want to date an unemployed widow with a kid anyway? On the way back from the police station, walking up Vitosa Road, Justina saw her neighbors staring out their windows and clustered on the sidewalk, stealing glances in her direction. She walked past, enjoying a smoke, trying to elicit eye contact so she could wave and make them fucking squirm, but no one bit. She was ambling through a nightmare, through a haze, and nothing seemed real. The kitchen sink is full of dishes. Rambo, her mother's dog, has left two piss puddles in the hallway that no one has bothered to clean up. Her son, Damian, is getting antsy on her lap and asks if he can go outside to play. It's cold and snowing, but Yustina pushes him off her. And don't come back, she thinks as he runs out of the kitchen. From the foyer, he yells, will Tato be back when I come home? Justina shrugs her shoulders. We'll see, she shouts back. She lights another cigarette. Upstairs, she hears her sister, Elvira, crying again. She hasn't stopped crying, and Justina can't blame her. Last night, Elvira's boyfriend killed Pavo, killed him upstairs, in the bathroom, cold-blooded, out of the blue, just like that. Selina, Alvira's daughter, wanders into the kitchen, a naked Barbie dangling from her skinny hand. Chochu, the dog peepeed by the stairs. Justina says nothing. Chochu, it stinks. Justina looks at her niece and her big blue eyes, her ratty hair like tangled straw, her pretty oval face. She hands Selina a dish towel. If it stinks, then clean it up. On the table, Yustina moves her ashtray around in a circle. She can still see Pavel's body in her head, twisted and puffy, splayed on the corner's table. Had his last word been an angry kurva, or a cry for her, a frantic Yusinka? 
No one gives a shit, and Yusina doesn't blame them. Her husband was just a carcass. She could see that in the way the examiners had poked at him. Papa would never be someone who used to be. To them, he was never... To them, he had never existed in the first place. He was a corpse. Yustina had stared at his gashes as if she too had no point of reference anymore, as if she was gazing at some unfortunate stranger and not at her husband at all. Two young cops drove her home. They were nice enough, and the one with the mustache was kind of cute. They told a joke about a prostitute and a blind gypsy, and Yustina laughed along. She asked to be dropped a few blocks from her house. The neighbors, she explained, rolling her eyes. They smiled. They smiled back at her kindly. And for a moment, Yustina thought that all of this, her husband's death, her kid, her mother's cancer, her whole fantastic, fucked up life, that all of it was a dream. And any moment, she'd wake up. So I go on Amazon and I read my reviews. I do. As an actress, I would always read my reviews too. And there's a trend happening. Because I know I love it. You, you write a book and you don't want to just read it to yourself every night, just like you don't want to perform a monologue in your closet. You, you write it so that people can read it. And you want to know, are they hating it? Are they loving it? And you don't even care if they're hating it, but you kind of want to know why. So there's like a thing. Either people love it, five star, or can't stand it. And the reason why a lot of people can't stand it is because the language. It's the cussing. They're so crude. These girls are unlikable. Uh, they're not refined. You make Polish people sound stupid. What's your ref? Uh, did you have any ref? Uh, what's your research on this, <laughs> girl? <laughs> and I wanted to say one thing. The characters I wrote, yes, they're hard and they're tough, and they're based on people I grew up with, um, and they're real. And you might not like them. You might not even think they're worthy of a story. They didn't go to college. Well, Anna did. Camila did. Uh, they come from broken homes. Um, and they're so tough. But there are moments where the shell cracks. You know, if you dig deep enough, and you see their soft, soft hearts. And that's why I wrote it. When I was 22, I got a phone call from my mother. I remember it like it was in the middle of the night or something dramatic, but I don't remember even when. And I picked up the phone and she's sobbing. I actually don't even know if it was a phone call or if I saw her and went to her apartment. I had just done The Count of Monte Cristo and a few other movies. I had moved out to uh, my own apartment with my sister. Life was awesome. And my mother was crying. And she said, do you remember? She named this girl that she used to hang out with in Poland a lot. She has a kid, you know, and her husband just got killed last night. I said, oh my god. And my mom was crying a lot, and hung up the phone. I hadn't seen this girl in years, and I couldn't stop thinking about it, you know. I couldn't get over the fact that sometimes we start life at the same kind of starting point, we're all ready. And some of us make like a hard left or a hard right. And some of us, for whatever reason, stay and plot on on their measly little shitty road. Some of them want to, some of them don't. But anyway, I was just started remembering all my summers and growing up and why is my life this way and her life this way and her life this way and his life this way. And I was overcome with all this guilt, this like, you know, why am I the girl that ended up in America, and I'm making movies now, but my dad still takes out the trash for the rich people up on the Upper West Side. What the fuck? And since I was a little girl, when I can't stop thinking about something, I start writing about it. So that's what I did. I started writing, and I came up with 50 pages of a thing called The Constellations. And it was basically like the skeleton of this, but it was very close to self and um, almost cathartic to get it out, and I got it out. My sister read it and went, this is really good, Dad. And then I got another movie, and then I just forgot about it. And cut two years later, I meet this amazing man named Patrick Wilson, who becomes my husband, and I have a baby, and I gain weight, and I don't act anymore because I'm just a mom. And then something in me that's like, ah, 
Remember we used to be, we used to tell stories. And uh, I couldn't really tell stories in film at that point because film won't accept you unless you're a size four. <laughs> so I found these pages. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm just lazy. <laughs> and I found these pages and I picked them up and I read them and started from scratch. And at that point, it had been years since this event that this book is part of it loosely based on. I never knew the details of what happened to my friend's husband. We never talked about it at all, ever. And I started writing again. And for two summers I wrote. I could only write in the summers. It was very strange. And I came with this. I came up with this. And my heart's in this. And just the fact that it exists is amazing to me. And, you know, I, I, I don't come from a family of artists or scholars. Um, I was the first one to go to college in my, in my immediate family. But I do come from a family of readers. My grandmother read to me when I was little. She told me stories. She made me memorize excerpts from famous Polish poems. My parents were readers. Uh, there were books all over my house. They didn't read to us, um, but they let us read. They showed us the way. So the fact that I wrote a book is like the biggest thing ever to everyone in my family. So there's three characters, but there's also a fourth, in my opinion. And that's Poland itself. Now, originally I had 500 pages, all right? And a lot of it was about Poland itself, a lot of historical tangents and stuff, because I thought, God, if, if I don't put all this in, I'm never going to write a book about Poland. Who's going to read two books about Poland? Uh, but then, you know, my amazing editing team at Random House said, let's make a story out of this and not uh, a thesis. <laughs> And then one of my mentors on this whole journey was this author, Adriana Trigiani, um, who's wonderful and amazing and, and was the first professional that read my manuscript and loved it. And recently I said, God, you know, I had so much great stuff in there, like magical realism and all these Polish folks' tales. And she said, Dad, those are yours forever. Just because they didn't make it in this book, they can make it in another one. So I'm writing another novel now, which is completely total based on nothing but just the story that came out of me about an American girl. Huh? But the third novel, I'm already way ahead, <laughs> is going to be like a prequel to this about um, the girl's parents. It's going to be a love story set in the 70s in Poland, and I'm going to get to put all that stuff in there. But anyway, the other, the other character is Poland. So there's a lot of things wrong with Poland, uh, and a lot of things that I still love, and I'll always love. And you talk to any hardened pole or any sentimental pole, and it touches something in them. I think if you come from anywhere else, and I think this country is ripe with that, you're all where you can, up to a certain moment, somebody always comes from somewhere else, from the old country, from somewhere else, from, we're a country of people who came from somewhere else. Um, and anyone who grew up in a household with two cultures, whose parents came from different walks of life and married, the way they do in this crazy melting pot, I think can take something else away from this novel, aside from the friendship and the coming of age and the murder and all that. Um, they can take away a love of a place, a memory of a place that means something. The stars in Poland are bright and sharp, as if torn from a connect the dots coloring book. They baffle Anna and remind her of religion and faith. In New York, the neon signs and tall buildings disturb the heavens, and all Anna can make out, aside from the moon, is the lone north star. But not here. Here the grass looks and smells like grass, rampant and overgrown among the cracked stones that pave the sidewalks. It's not pretty. It's a far cry from the well-manicured lawns in Brooklyn, but it's real. Even downtown, you can sometimes inexplicably catch a whiff of cow manure and wheat. Here, nature forces its way into every corner in its purest form, and the stars take over at night, illuminating everything the way God intended. It's all as if from a fairy tale. The blackbirds call at seven in the morning, the magpies fly at dusk, the century-old wooden huts nestled to the brightly painted 70s-era communist apartment housing. Everyone smokes and laughs, but nobody smiles unless they really fucking mean it. <laughs> and at the heart of everything 
is the one thing that unites everyone. Przetrwanie. Survival. So... Um, So that's my story. Does anyone have questions? See, the Polish people are crying in the back. I told you. A touch of something. Uh, yes? We have lots in common. I grew up in the shadow of uh, the Glenwood houses. I lived a few blocks away, and my parents are from Poland. Oh, really? Um, but uh, probably at that point, some of the similarities basically Right. Where is the hometown? Where is it near? What large city? Um, it is an hour north of Krakow. Okay. And two hours south of Warsaw. It's kind of south central. And how close to the Russian border? Oh, not too close. Quite a ways. Yeah, like a ten-hour train ride. Yeah. So basically, you lived near Ralph Avenue. Yeah. I, yes, I did. Flat Avenue H. Right. Uh, and yeah, that's so funny. My Hi. question is, yes. you made an interesting comment that you were just a mom. On what, Leonard Lope? No, no, no. Or just, you were, I'm, I'm a guy that was on Leonard Lope. Too. <laughs> when you were speaking, right. that you, you know, stopped acting, you weren't a size four and you became a mom. Right. Um, well, just a mom. Come on. What is just a mom? Just a mom is being everything. Of course. It's the biggest, best role I ever had. I would do anything for my kids. They're amazing. However, sometimes I feel like a father who's good uh, is amazing. And the, the standard, the, the um, criteria for being an amazing mom uh, is so much higher than for a father. And a father can retain bits of himself before he became a father far easier than a mother can because it consumes us. It overcomes us. It overwhelms us. Uh, we live for our kids. They're literally from our bodies. It's a di not to say, my, listen, my husband is one of the best fathers I've had. He's morning tonight. If he could be with his kids all day, he would. And he does help, and he cooks, and he cleans, and he's amazing. I'll take him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not done with him yet. <laughs> but I was also a very creative young person, a young woman. I wrote, I acted, I, uh, I wanted to create things, art, whatever you want to call it. It sounds maybe cliche or whatever, but I did for a long time. And when you become a mother and you let that go by the wayside or you even don't want to create anymore, after a while, it starts gnawing at you a little bit that forgotten place in you, um, and, it, and, and you start to resent things. So what helped me was I started writing again, a few sentences a day, and it was enough. It was my time. So I don't mean just a mother, um, but I didn't want to be just a mother, too. You know what I mean? And that's all right. I love to read it. And I think that you take out the cuss words. Yeah. Listen, buy the book, take a black marker, find all the F words. No, 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 no. I think it goes. It belongs there. It does belong there. And I know, I mean, some people have a really hard time with it. Listen, my, I grew up around it. Maybe it's, I have a potty mouth. And for the longest time, I didn't curse because my dad, oh, he would spew it. Everything was fuck, 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 fuck. And uh, uh, till I was 16, I fudge. Uh, you know, I would not curse. And uh, the thing is, sometimes it's just, um, it's a good sounding word. And these people talk like this. And it doesn't make them any less human or intelligent or anything. Sometimes they just, I wrote a thing about it in my blog. It was called the F word because I'd read so many comments about why the language? <laughs> because this is their language. Because sometimes maybe these people lack the means or the time or the self, uh, the incentive to look for a better word to show their love or their fear or their anger. And they just take the easiest word and that's the word they pick up and it becomes part of their rhetoric and part of their speech. But I, I, it's not like you're not going to find fuck on every single page. Um, uh, you know, there, <laughs> I, 
dialogue is important to me. I'm an actress. So when I was writing these characters, I wanted them to sound true to me. And not all of them speak this way. There's one girl, Yustina, who, who has a really tough mouth. And the tougher the mouth, I find, the softer the heart. Your reading was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and then you can say them in Polish. What? Oh, there's some kurvas in there, too. <laughs> I, you know what? I don't cuss in Polish in my home. I, I, I feel like to me, kurva sounds so much worse than the F word. I don't know why. <laughs> Should we just talk about cursing? <laughs> yes? Um, is it going to be published in Poland? Yes, it is. This um, uh, publishing house, Sonia Draga, bought it and it will be um, published in the spring of 2014, which I'm so excited and so scared about, because <laughs> we're tough critics. Um, but yes, it is. I'm very, very happy. Um, you know, I use Polish girls in the title. And uh, Did I say this already, or did I say this on the radio show? I don't know. But my Polish girls are, are, are three characters that are, some of them are based on people I knew. Some of them just came out of me as, a, as, a, as, as their creator. Uh, and they're different than the Polish girls that I met in college, or the Polish girls that live in Warsaw, or the Polish girls that uh, live in Greenpoint. Um, they're my Polish girls, so we'll see how, <coughs> how the Polish girls in Poland um, find them. So you'll be putting some English words in there. You know, I think so. Yeah, the reason why I put, there's a, there's a smattering of Polish words in here, and some of them, if you're smart, uh, uh, you can pick right up, and, and some of them I... Uh, I add the translation into it, like in the context, and some I leave alone. And I think why I did that subconsciously was for a lot of my life, I went to a dictionary to learn another language. For a lot of my life, my parents still, what does this word mean? They have to look things up. That's a big thing, to not know a language. And I feel like English-speaking people, Americans, are quite lucky because the rest of the world speaks English. Very rarely will an English person not know will have to rely on a dictionary anymore. So I feel like there was my little bit of a to the readers. And some of them say, I don't know what this word means. Um, Google it. Google Translate. Work a little. I remember when I was reading uh, The um, Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, but I loved that book. And there was so much Spanish in it that I didn't know. And I would look it up. I would look it up. I would love to look it up. And I wanted to give the readers a sense of, oh god, I don't know what this word means. Hi, welcome to my life. <laughs> and those who came before me on a very small little level. Can't say I'm that. Yeah. Anyway. Anybody else? Yes? I have not read your book yet. I love your But you're so going to now, right? <laughs> no, I am. I promise you. Um, and I'll talk about it. Uh, character development. Um, I'm working with a, a gentleman who's written a children's a teenage book. And I pointed out to him that I grew up in Darien with a dictionary next to me right. when I read. Right. And I was into Jules Verne in sixth grade with Mrs. Right. Hamilton. And I taxed myself on, on reading because my parents, as yours, enriched that. So I applaud you. If oh. You have um, pushed the limits a little bit. Thank you. There's no reason to be ever ashamed of that. And uh, I welcome your second book as well. Thank you so much. So I read, thank you so much. That means a lot. I read to my boys every night, and that's what I do to my son. He's seven years old. He reads above his level, naturally. <laughs> uh, but I still give him a pencil, and I say, underline what you don't know. Don't just skim it. Underline it and bring it to me, and we'll look it up. And that's what we do. And you know, uh, you can't live in my house without running into a book. So it's something you pass on. And. Um, Hopefully, it's there for life with them. Yes? Are you teaching your children to speak Polish? I am teaching my children to speak Polish. Is your husband Polish? No, he's American. Well, he's learning too. He is learning too. He has no choice. Um, he's as American as it gets. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, I, it was quite easier when before my oldest one went to school. As soon as he went to school, he started coming home and saying, wait a minute. I'm the only one that's speaking this, and you can speak English because I hear you speak it to daddy. So why? So I take him to Poland almost every summer, and I, you know, push him outside the door, and 
then he starts speaking it rapidly and great, and then he's so proud of himself. It's tough. It's tough when the spouse is not a native speaker. It becomes hard. You don't want you want to be inclusive, you, you know. But my husband is the biggest supporter of that, and he's amazingly wonderful. And um, we just shot a movie together in Poland where he had to speak Polish throughout the whole movie. My American husband, um, and I was his teacher. That was fun. Um, yes, I want my children to. Learning a language as a kid not only is a great thing just to learn another language, but on a different level, a level they can't quite comprehend yet, you're learning that other cultures exist, other languages, other people, that the world is bigger than what's right here. And I got that just from coming from another country, but I want them to get that too. Um, and I think, you know, by having our little daily Polish lessons, it's a start. Yes? Oh, are you? Oh, wow. Right. But when, all, all you need is a little bit of Polish in you. Uh, yes, you know, my agent says it's so cinematic and there's uh, interest in it and this director would like to read the book. And, and yes, one day, sure. But I also am an actress and I know how that world works and I know they could take your product and give you their best intentions and turn it around and it's nothing. You know, and I also know as an avid reader and an avid moviegoer, you cannot, you're doing yourself a disservice if you go in uh, to a movie based on your favorite book, thinking it's going to be the same thing, because they're different. This is a, a, a literary version, and that is a cinematic one, and you cannot compare the two. Um, it's not fair to do so, but I know I would do it if I went to see the movie, which is why I'm not selling any rights right now. And I do, I, I had this big phone meeting about it, and I do want to take a stab at um, turning it into a screenplay, adapting it. So. And any, um, I have not, You, so you don't, you don't have to. see you act because I think oh. you read so well and, um, and I love your, your acting. Thank you. <laughs> Higher Ground is a good one I can recommend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've done a few. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes? I read the book also. You did? It was, it was in the uh, tongue written in Puna Half. That it was that half English right. and half Polish. Well, half so, and half? You think it was half and half? Certainly not. No. <laughs> but, but if you are English and was raised, were raised by a Pole, you would understand the book very easily. Right. Except for the yeah. person, which I thought it was over the top. You did? Yes. I, yes, there's some people who, who, uh, uh, who thought that. Yes. It had a good story, right? But the cursing brought it down. Why? Why? It was just redundant. It wasn't used uh, to stand out. You think throughout, or just in certain no, sections? In certain sections. Yes. It was almost written as if two people wrote it. Well, there's two, three different characters. So when you, I was writing a new cinema. It was written, almost written as if two people wrote it because in some chapters. There was no right. no foul language, right. but in other chapters, it was throughout. Right. Well, I think that's uh, according to what was being written about and what character uh, I was writing about. I, like I said, it's tough. Uh, some of these, I know people in my life who talk this way, whether that insults you or it sounds unladylike. Uh, that's kind of the actor in me, being true to the person I was creating. And that's okay, not everyone, you know, uh, is going to be like, yeah, people are going to have that reaction. But does, you know, does that take away from it all, or can you put that aside? Or, uh, you know, somebody wrote, uh, there was so much cursing in this chapter that I just didn't finish the book. Well, then that's, you know, what can I do with that? I can't. This is how I wrote it. Uh, and I'm sticking to it. It's too late now. <laughs> I also don't want anyone to think there's like a F you on every single page. There isn't, but people who have, who don't curse are going to be, you know, it's also I'm a woman. I think perhaps if a man wrote this, it wouldn't be such an issue, honestly, uh, with women and with men. Anyway, yes. 
Can you tell us a little bit about your dad and his activities in Poland? And, you know, yes. What happened to him? My dad was, um, he was a, a handsome uh, rogue. Um, and when he was, he came from a line of his great grandfather fought in the war, and his grandfather fought in the underground army in Poland during World War II. And his father was also a political activist in the late 70s, and, uh, in the early 70s. And uh, one day, uh, my dad got a phone call and said, You have to go to the hospital and identify your father because he's been clubbed to death by the Polish Milicja, which was a communist police. Um, he was 23, and I was a month old. I know, it was happened on August 17th, 1976. Um, and there's my dad, kind of, he boxed a little, he played soccer semi-professionally. He was kind of a, a shark, uh, a cad. And um, he turned his life around and became uh, kind of this idealist, this political activist, this freedom fighter. And um, as soon as there were rumblings of solidarity, solidarity was um, started by, well, uh, the shipyard workers who wanted to form the workers' union. And um, it kind of spread to Poland all over. People formed unions. They wanted to have rights. And um, my dad became a leader. Uh, uh, there's eight kind of regions, provinces of Poland. He became head of one of them. He had a I don't know, 60,000 workers under his helm. He was one of the eight founding members of Solidarity. Um, he was, uh, and then on December 13, 1981, martial law was declared because things were getting to an extreme. There was um, riots, there were tanks in the street. Uh, we lived off ration cards. There was nothing in the stores. It was, it was terrible. It was, a, it was, and the people kind of had had enough. And um, so as an effort to Welch, this kind of movement, um, they rounded up a bunch of these political guys who worked under Wałęsa and they carted them off to prison. My dad was one of them, and he remained there for 11 months. And um, after 11 months, the government said, well, you know, this isn't working. Now, because we imprison these guys, there's more people joining this union thing, and there's more of a camaraderie among these workers, and we can't control it, so why don't you leave? And they allowed a lot of people to leave, and a lot of people with small family, with kids, and left one-way passports to London, West Germany, Paris, Canada, uh, the States. And my dad, being my dad, um, uh, not only fighting for freedom, but you know, somewhere if I were to psychoanalyze him, and I've never done that before, uh, was trying to avenge his father's senseless death. Uh, said, "No, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay in prison." for as long as it takes. This is 1983. So nobody knew that, you know, 1990, things would change. We would get our democratic elections. We would be free. Berlin Wall would fall, all that stuff. And my mother, being 28 years old, said, we have two young daughters. We were living off of the churches. Uh, like, they would send us food. She is not, you know, it was bad. It was bad, dire. So he said, fine. And Along the way, while he was in prison, he met this journalist who worked for the AFL-CIO, this American-Ukrainian man, and they formed kind of a friendship. And this man, Adrian Karatniki, um, sponsored us, and uh, the AFL-CIO, within three days, said, we will sponsor this family. And um, we stayed two weeks at this interim camp in Germany, and then we came to Brooklyn, uh, to New York, and we lived in this hotel called the Breslin Hotel on the Lower East Side. Um, and that's it. We had one suitcase, a couple of dollars, and we said goodbye to our family forever. I mean, I can't imagine that. You know, 1983, coming from a Soviet bloc country to New York, New York, was a huge, huge thing. I remember I, 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 the first time I was given an orange, you know, there were all these embargo laws. You didn't have, like, citrus or bit into it because I had no idea what it was. I look at me now, you guys. <laughs> The American dream. <laughs> no, it's true. The thing about America, you know, he's talking about how great Poland is and how amazing. America is pretty great too. Here's the thing: like, you're not guaranteed that your American dream will come true here. It's not a guarantee when when you get here as an immigrant kid or you're born here. But it's a huge possibility in this country. It really is. And I'm so grateful for that because um, you can make it happen here. And I think. It's happening. It's 
happened, you know. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I believe the DAG is going to be signing books um, up front. Um, if anybody would like to advertise, fuck you, love DAG. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs>